Welcome back, everyone. I'm Cass Pianci, and I am here with my partner in crime, as usual, Bennett Tomlin. How are you? Doing well. How are you, Cass? I'm doing good. Thank you. Today, we're going to broach a pretty intense topic, which is the fact that El Salvador is adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. I'm not going to delve too deep into that right at the get-go. I'd prefer that we look into every aspect of this as we discuss it. So, Bennett Tomlin... Can you tell us a bit about what this means in general, whether it means the standard definition of legal tender or if we're talking about something different, uh, give a, a broad scope of that if you can? Yeah. So generally, when countries talk about legal tender, they're using it to mean that the bill, the banknote, whatever, has to be accepted by the government in terms of paying your taxes or other debts to the government. El Salvador's specific definition of legal tender goes a little bit farther, and it is required that all economic agents who are able must now accept Bitcoin. So merchants, business people, stuff like that are now required to accept Bitcoin, if at all possible. If we reflect on what that means in the U.S., legal tender tends to mean that you can pay outstanding debts to the federal government with U.S. banknotes, federal reserve notes, or coinage. Those rules do not extend to the state level, and they do not extend to private merchants and vendors. So this is the crux of the issue, I would say, for hardcore Bitcoiners who want to toe the line between being pro-Bitcoin and anti-statist. Do you think that's right? I think this is... An important issue in that regard, because often in the Bitcoin ideology and in the narratives that surround it, you see this very much anti-state and anti-coercion philosophy. And this seems inherently to be coercive by the state and so would generally be rejected by Bitcoiners. But it also represents like such an important moment in Bitcoin's history from their perspective. It's a country adopting it as legal tender, which is a thing that hasn't happened before. And so I think you see a lot of conflict among them because of that dissonance that's in those two things. Yeah. And I'm going to go ahead and give a little bit of background on El Salvador. El Salvador is really small. And I think most people in the world don't know a lot about El Salvador. I myself was pretty unaware of a lot of the history of El Salvador. Issues in El Salvador kind of started at the same time that they started with other countries in the region. So Panama, um, Belize, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, all of them have had issues with the Western world. And they all started to have issues with the Western world in the late 1800s, early 1900s. US and other Western countries started to have a very influential role in, in El Salvador and elsewhere in Central America in this time and since. So specifically with El Salvador, if you look at the civil war that began in the 1980s and ended in the 1990s, the U.S. definitely supported the more authoritarian, violent regime. And at the same time, Cuba and the USSR and other Soviet allies supported the leftists in El Salvador, but it caused a crisis there. It's also on the Ring of Fire, which is a geographic region prone to earthquakes and seismic activity, including, you know, volcanic eruptions. This provides a couple good things. Uh, it provides geothermal electricity. It's provided them with very nutrient-rich soil and the ability to grow fruits, vegetables, coffee, a lot of wonderful things. Simultaneously, we've had volcanic eruptions and super deadly earthquakes because, as usual, when you look at earthquake deaths, uh, you can look around the world, whether it's in Iran, China, Indonesia, India, the places that suffer the most deaths and injuries during an earthquake are places that don't have proper infrastructure. So while Japan could have a nine point whatever earthquake, most people would be fine. But a place like El Salvador, when they have like a, a 6.5, it results in thousands and thousands of deaths because they are not properly built for that. But Bitcoin is supposed to solve a lot of this or hopefully solve a lot of this. Can we talk about what that would look like, Bennett? We can try. <laughs> I think what 
you're seeing here is that because El Salvador has a lot of these problems and a lot of these problems are rooted in like American imperialism and like these influence of these other countries from outside of them and due to the fact that El Salvador had to basically dollarize and give up their own currency, the cologne, which has limited their ability to improve their infrastructure and do a lot of the stuff they would need to start to modernize their country, there was a lot of incentives in place for them to look to alternatives. And so if they can adopt something like Bitcoin, and because of that, increase the number of remittances coming in with remittances counting for 20% of their GDP, that helps them build up and aggregate the amount of money in El Salvador. Or you see it potentially as a way to attract new investment, new businesses. And so I think what they're hoping is that the adoption of Bitcoin will help bring new money into the country. Well, I think there's also a bet that Bitcoin will continue to increase in value. And so that by having a holding of Bitcoin after people have exchanged it through the trust, that the country's reserves could also benefit from increases in the price of Bitcoin. Francis Coppola spoke about this. The idea being that it seems risky to bet some of your country's reserves on Bitcoin. But because El Salvador is a dollarized economy without a mint that can get them dollars or something equivalent to dollars. They are relying on either exports being greater than imports or remittances giving them far greater assets coming in than going out. That That is not what is happening in El Salvador. And so you look for yield in other places because you're forced to. It isn't a matter of desire. It's not like El Salvador uh, is looking to take more risk on the little money that it has. I think a lot of Bitcoiners and other people would suggest that the reason they're doing this is because in a sense they're being forced to. Do you think there's any truth to that? I think there is a bit of truth in that. And the current president of El Salvador, Bukele, he has in large part tried to deal with a lot of the issues El Salvador is doing by spending pretty rapidly. However, that has now put El Salvador in the position where it's been harder and harder for them to get new money, debt to get new debt, and their cost of their debt has continued to go up, which has put them in a difficult financial position. They were negotiating for a large loan from the International Monetary Fund, but the IMF generally, when they give you money, there's lots of strings attached to it often involving cuts to programs, austerity, and other things that can make it difficult to sustain your economy. And so I think in that difficult position they were in, you can kind of see why trying to find an alternative outside of that system would be appealing. I know that there's a lot of countries that have had to face the IMF and the World Bank when it came to the way they are distributing wealth or or whatever. I think in most of those cases, they cave to the demands of the IMF or the World Bank. But, and, and again, maybe, maybe you know better than I do. I know who would know for sure is Peter, uh, Peter Ryan. But I feel like a good example of a country saying no to the IMF would be Ireland. Did they say no to the IMF? Do you know if that's true? I don't remember that specific story. There was one story that Peter shared about in Ireland's history when a bunch of bankers went on strike and everyone expected the country would shut down and go into like this whole economic collapse. But instead, the pubs started like issuing credit to various people and everything like continued to function on this system of IOUs. But I don't remember specifically about Ireland in 2008. I guess the only point I'm trying to make here is that when the IMF and the World Bank turn against you, it becomes a a significant uphill battle if it wasn't already. And that isn't to disparage anyone who's trying to put push forward on this. It's just that it it becomes increasingly uphill, especially in a poverty stricken country. I'm growing concerned because I'm seeing the powers that be, if you will, turn against a very small country for its decision to adopt Bitcoin. And while I think there are very legitimate concerns there, I mean, we do not know a lot about Naib Bukele. He's clearly done things that are borderline authoritarian. So I, I wouldn't put that kind of move past him. Now, you have to ask yourself when there's a country that's been in such dire need of help and so stricken with corruption, if sometimes the hard authoritative hand 
of someone is required. And I hate to suggest that because uh, it's the classic slippery slope argument. But I guess what I'm suggesting is that it's too early to call him a dictator. I will not call him that for right now. I think marching your military into the legislature to pass your bills and to fire the people investigating you is certainly an extraordinarily bad look and looks a lot like authoritarianism from where I'm sitting. I, I also don't want to go too far because he does seem to be a democratically elected leader of this country. He is still extraordinarily powerful. And like we mentioned previously, there is a bad history of American and other intervention in El Salvador. And so I don't want to do anything that would suggest that I think that is necessarily the solution here. We've touched the surface of a couple issues here. There's one that we don't know the implications of Bitcoin being forced upon the populace. Two, this is a very volatile region and it is prone to big problems, whether it's political or economical. Three, we don't know the intentions of the current leader, though it's okay to hope they're good, but also expect the worst. I think both of those things are fine. But we haven't touched on another major issue, which is that this all seems to have been at least partially instigated by Strike and Jack Maulers. Can we talk about how this is actually being implemented? Like, can we talk about Strike and and Lightning and Layer 2? You're much more informed than I am about this stuff. I can try. It's still a little bit unclear exactly how this implementation is going to work. The previous implementation of Strike Global basically involved someone having cash in an account at Strike at one end, it being converted to Bitcoin, the Bitcoin being transferred and then sold for tethers, and the person then having tethers in their account that they can withdraw. The newer implementation, according to Mallers, when he was on Peter McCormick's podcast, is that it will not depend on Tether. They're integrating directly with both the banks and the cash point services in El Salvador. But there's still some other questions about what exactly this is going to look like. El Salvador has said they're putting up um, $150 million in a trust with the state bank so that businesses and merchants will be able to instantaneously convert, is what they said. But it hasn't been explained how that's going to work technically, where the exchange rate for that is going to be derived from, or, any, or if it can go the other way. Can someone put dollars into that account and purchase any Bitcoins that have been exchanged since the trust? There was also a recent announcement that they're doing effectively like an airdrop of $35 in Bitcoin to anyone who signs up, and that totals out to each El Salvadorian citizen at a little over $100 million. Odds are not everyone is going to sign up, but it's with the $150 million for a country with El Salvador with pretty thin reserves, that's potentially a lot of money to be putting into a project like this. The other thing with Strike in general is that it is this custodial lightning solution, right? And so you don't control your private keys. You don't control your lightning node here. You're basically depending on Strike to provide these services for you. Strike opens up a couple of channels to other liquidity providers so that you can often find a route to other nodes and other providers, but not necessarily. And Strike's nodes themselves are, you cannot connect to Strike's nodes without permission from Strike. So it's, so you're somewhat limited in what other channels can be added. All of this together leaves us kind of confused at this moment about how all these different pieces are going to go together. And that's particularly troubling because they're all supposed to be totally implemented like 60 days from now. And when the bill was passed, it had this timeline of 90 days. We're like 15 or 20 days past that from now. And so within like two and a half months, they expect to have this entire system integrated across all these banks, into the state banks, into all the cash point services, and have training set up with equipment to give out to people so that they can start accepting Bitcoin. And that sounds extraordinarily difficult. I also heard another point, and I, I don't know how much this has been refuted or how well it will be refuted by the time this comes out, but Strike by Zap doesn't have the proper licensing for all the U.S. states that it claims it does. I've heard there's there's ways to get around that. So it, so, so it might have no no ripple effect whatsoever. 
It's, it's certainly a thing I was questioning when I saw that. I think the article was from Decrypt, and they got some comments from, like, some of the Anderson Krill lawyers on it. And basically their take was, it looks like strike. Anderson Kill, but I do like that you said Anderson Krill, just because uh, <laughs> Pally is always talking about... Um... Herring? Uh, yeah. And so it seemed their interpretation was it is that strike was likely not in complete compliance. And that's especially difficult if you're hoping to get a lot of your remittance dollars coming back from the United States, right? You don't want the company providing that service to end up in the crosshairs of U.S. regulators. I'm not a lawyer. I don't feel qualified to opine on whether or not they're fully compliant. But my impression was that there may be issues there. Same impression you had. I don't know if we've come to any kind of conclusion about this. I don't think we have. I think we're trying to hedge our bets. The aspect that has been most interesting to me is that coiners who I fully expected to support this move have largely been against it. And individuals like Francis Coppola and others have been not supportive, but not opposed. And I think that is surprising for me and eye-opening too, because the reasons that, for instance, Francis Coppola gives for supporting this are not out of like some pro-status perspective. She's not saying like, good, I'm glad the state is getting involved in Bitcoin. That's not her argument at all. It's a very monetary, uh, fiscal perspective. And also, I see people like Niraj talking about it and saying, like, this is fucked up and gross. Not that loudly. And I find myself agreeing with both of them. And I don't know what to make of it. In the end, I, I do think this could very well be a good thing for El Salvador. I actually want to say that. I, I do think this could be good for El Salvador. On the other hand, it's very scary. And I think there's a lot of reasons to be incredibly worried about it. I agree with a lot of that. I think we've seen reasonable objections from a lot of people across the Bitcoiner ideology thought spectrum object to especially the article in the bill that requires people to accept Bitcoin. That specifically seems to be against basically everyone's philosophy on what should be included in a bill like this, but it's been included. And so my biggest fear with this is actually a little bit different, and it's related to like the position El Salvador is in, right? They they don't print their own money, they so they're unable to print to pay their debts, to handle their spending, to do some of that. And so I am curious if at some point Berkeley or someone like him would not use like a combination of dollars and Bitcoin in the reserves to try and start their own fiat currency again. And that's like what the long-term play is as a chance to give El Salvador their own sovereign currency again. Beyond that, I hope that when the money comes into the country to set up the volcano Bitcoin mines and to provide these various wallets and these services. I hope enough of that money ends up going to build out infrastructure, to strengthen the power grid, to improve access to the internet and technology, and to help modernize El Salvador in that, those ways, because I'm optimistic that those investments in the infrastructure could benefit El Salvador, regardless of how this experiment turns out. I think there's a lot to like about this, and there's a lot to dislike about this. From what I'm hearing, you have people who support this move in some sense, but really do not like a lot of the aspects of this bill. And I think a lot of people throughout the world can empathize with that. So maybe you support building infrastructure in America, but you think climate change isn't real. Like these, <laughs> these things become political and weird, and it, it happens very quickly. So we don't know intentions and we don't know the future. So we we have to hope that this is going to be good for, for everyone in El Salvador. And I do hope that. I think El Salvador has gotten the short end of the stick for a very long time. And it has been no help of the United States where I live. And we're not being held accountable for that. And so if that means that they have to seek a way to free themselves of being dollarized, that's fine. Unfortunately, there's no example of any country that has ever dollarized de-dollarizing successfully. So I hope this is a first. And I hope also that Bukele doesn't do more tactics that feel authoritarian and then eventually become authoritarian. I can have my thoughts on it, but 
Who cares unless you speak to the Salvadoran people? The one thing I want to add is that while this does seem to be an attempt to de-dollarize, that is a prospect that's far out in the future. They still have a huge amount of their debt currently denominated in U.S. dollars, and they're going to owe U.S. dollars on that debt for the foreseeable future. And so El Salvador is still going to be dependent on getting U.S. dollars into their country to continue paying those. But I, as well, hope that this plays out well for El Salvador and is a useful tool for their population and for their country as a whole. So complex issue. We don't have the hardest opinion on this as opposed to most other things that we care about, but we wanted to kind of explain it to everyone in, in the most critical but careful way possible. We're actually going to be releasing two episodes this week. So this episode is going to be our first episode. And then in a few days, we're going to be releasing an episode about regulatory capture. Um, yeah, two episode week. Enjoy. Enjoy.